Good morning, everyone. So, uh, my heart is racing, not gonna lie. Okay, um, before I get started today, I ha wanted to do two things. Um, I wanted to thank the elders for this opportunity to be able to speak before y'all. It's always a privilege to share God's word before his people. And I wanted to give a quick shout out for our gospel and 90 days reading plan. Um, as a youth group, we've been going through each of the gospels every day since January, and it's been super impactful just to see some of the insights that you guys have brought. So if you haven't already, feel free, you can scan that QR code, or you can ask one of us for the link, but we have about 10 more days left, so feel free to join with us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for allowing us just to come to your presence today. Thank you for allowing us just to see your mercies one more time. God, thank you for just allowing us to come together as a church family when many others can't meet God. We ask that today these words not be mine, God, but we ask that I merely just be a vessel for you to speak to your people, God. I ask that any uncomfortableness we feel, any pain we feel, God, it just be from you so that we draw close to you, God. I thank you for all that you're doing. Continue to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message today is how do you see Jesus? And when Jitu Chachan asked me to speak about a month ago, this was just something that God placed in my heart. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through a couple different scripture portions and talk about different people who saw Jesus through a certain lens. So if we could turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 17, we'll be starting there. And we'll be reading about the story of the 10 lepers who come to Jesus to be healed. I'll be reading from verse 11 through 19. Then on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as Jesus entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and then they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. So when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And then they went and they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and was giving him thanks. Now, this man was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, we're not 10 cleansed, where are the nine? With no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner. And he said to him, rise and go your way for your faith has made you well. So this is a story many of us have read before, but basically what we see is 10 lepers coming to Jesus to be healed. And we know that at this time, lepers were considered to be outcasts in society. And it was actually documented during our 21 days of fasting prayer, who showed me that the one leper who comes back after he's cleansed is seeking more than just a physical healing, but he's coming back for a spiritual healing as well. But in this story, we see nine people who receive the same thing that the Samaritan does, but they don't come back. And the reason they don't come back is the nine who return, never return only saw Jesus as a way to change their social status. And are we doing this today too? Are we inserting Bible verses and into our um, Instagram bio or WhatsApp status so people think we're perfect? Are we chasing after spiritual positions because we want people to know we have power? Or are we looking to serve Jesus because it'll look good on our resume when it comes time to apply for college or a job? And as I was preparing for this message, God kind of convicted me of something that I was doing last semester. So I was enrolled in chemistry, and I think I'm very open about this, I suck at chemistry. So it was looking a struggle last semester, but every time I had a test, I would notice this pattern of my prayer life increasing. Every time there was a test on Friday, morning, evening, and night, my prayer life, I was really close to God, or I, I thought I was close to God. But what I realized was after the test happened, my prayer life would go silent. And what I realized was I was only praying because I wanted people to see me not as a failure, but someone who was successful. So in that situation, I was using Jesus as a way to change my own social status. So this morning, how do you see Jesus? The next chapter, if you want to turn a page in your Bible, is in Luke chapter 18. We'll be looking at verses 18 to 25. And in this story, we see a ruler coming to Jesus to ask how he can have eternal life. So let's look at Jesus' response. Luke chapter 18, verse 18 to 25. So the ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. 
See, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all of these I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And then you will have a treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the ruler heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult is it for those to have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. In this passage, when the ruler comes to Jesus, he says, Good teacher, how can I have eternal life? But what I wanted to point out is that the ruler only saw Jesus as a good teacher. And don't get me wrong, Jesus is a good teacher. But the issue with only seeing Jesus as a teacher is that everything in the Bible will just become good advice. This will just be a good way to handle your finances. This will just be a good way to treat people when you go to work or when you go to school. But if you only see him as a teacher, you won't move past it just being advice. And when we only see Jesus as a teacher, everything in the Bible will start picking and choosing what we want to follow. See, the ruler had no issue following the Ten Commandments. It was easy for him not to steal from others. He had wealth. It was easy for him not to commit adultery. It was easy for him to do all those things. But when Jesus said, give up what you have and follow me, he's not able to. And when we see Jesus as only a teacher, giving up things will be difficult because we don't realize what we're gaining. In this chapter, Jesus is offering the um, ruler eternal treasures in heaven. And if you think about it in the grand scheme, these treasures will last forever. There's no amount of taxes and no amount of things that can be taken on this. It's forever his. But for the sake of keeping what he had, he says, I can't do it. And sometimes we aren't willing to give up things that make us comfortable, whether it be our time, our money, or our beliefs. So this morning, how do you see Jesus? The last uh, portion I want to turn to would be Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 through 9. And in this chapter, we see the Pharisees coming to Jesus, and they think they finally caught him at a loop because of the traditions his disciples are breaking. So I'll read from verse 1 through 9. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 through 9. So then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And Jesus answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? See, God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles your father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, you need not to honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching doctrines as the commandment of men. The Pharisees saw Jesus as a threat to their traditions and their culture. And have we come to the same place where we've made our faith about the things we need to do rather than how we were saved? And sometimes we act like the Pharisees because we like to judge people for the way they look or the things they do, but we don't know their story and we don't know their past. And we think we're doing God's work by holding on to our traditions and culture so tightly, but are we making the word of God void this morning? See, at the end of the day, Jesus should be worth more to us than our need to never change. And I believe culture and tradition is all important, but the good news of the gospel wasn't just made for our church this morning. It wasn't just made for our people who look like us. It wasn't just made for people who are, have everything all together. But the good news of the gospel was made for everybody. So like the Pharisees, we shouldn't be trying to contain, confine the truth to the way we've been doing things for the last 20, 30 years. Each and every day, we need to seek out Jesus and see him for who he is. Because when we truly see Jesus, it'll make us change the way we live our lives. So I talked about three groups of people. I talked about the lepers who saw Jesus as only a way to change their social status. I talked about the ruler who only saw Jesus as a good teacher. And I talked about the Pharisees who only saw Jesus as a threat. 
Now, each of these three groups of people had unique perspectives, but none of them were able to see Jesus for who he was. And in the Bible, there's one man who could sympathize with all three groups of these people, and he was able to see who Jesus was. Paul, as we've been learning in, through our study of the book of Acts, was a Pharisee who had lots of wealth, and towards the end of his life, he started experiencing different types of sicknesses. But after he's converted in Acts chapter 9, we see Paul is able to see Jesus for something that none of the other people were able to see him for. If we turn to Philippians chapter 2, we see Paul writing to the church on who Jesus is. So we'll be looking at Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11. And Paul writes, Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. And being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul was able to see Jesus as Christ and as the Lord. And I was doing a little research on Paul's life as I was prepping for my message today. And many scholars believe that Paul was about 30 years old when he was converted on his way to Damascus. And that he died a little over the age of 60. So for 30 years, Paul has this truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it doesn't just stop there for Paul. Paul continues to search out and learn about Jesus every day. And through that, he has different realizations about what he needs to do with his life. And I find that funny because whenever we get baptized or whenever we get saved nowadays, we kind of just stop our pursuit of learning more about Jesus. We think that once we um, say that Jesus died for our sins, that's all we need to know about the gospel. But I want us to look at some of the responses we need to have after we see Jesus as the Christ. And these are a couple short verses, so you don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. So the first realization I want us to have is realizing that we are all sinners in need of saving. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul writes this. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. See, all of us need to approach our spiritual walks from this perspective. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you've been coming to church. As long as we're in this world, we're going to have an innate sinful nature that we need to fight against. And this is a contrast to the Pharisees who sought to point out the flaws in everyone else while ignoring their own. Paul has no issue saying, I am the chief of sinners, because he realizes the work of Christ that's happening in his life. And today we can do the same. The second realization I want us to have is that everything is worthless that we have in this world in comparison to knowing Jesus more. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul writes, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. In the full context of that chapter, Paul is talking about that if anyone should have confidence in his flesh, it's him. He was circumcised on the eighth day according to all the worldly standards, and on top of it, he is a Roman citizen. But for the sake of all that, he counts it worthless. And we've been learning the book of Acts, the different trials he's undergone as he's stood before different people and been accused. No matter what Paul had, it didn't matter to him if he couldn't know Jesus more. This is a contrast to the ten lepers and the young ruler. See, nothing about Paul's social status, nothing about his past, nothing about his possessions mattered to him more than knowing Jesus. Today, are we trying to hold on to things we've done 30 years ago? Are we trying to hold on to the positions we serve, the things we've done for Jesus? Or are we trying to know more about Jesus? Because in this time we're on this earth, there's no way we can know everything about him, and there's always more we can learn. And the worship team can come up as I come into this last point. But what I want us to realize is that there is a life beyond the grave and that the Lord will bring those who are faithful 
into his kingdom. I'll be reading 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17 to 18. And we see Paul is at the end of his life as he says his words. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul knew that one day he would be in the presence of his Savior. It didn't matter the suffering he had on this earth. It didn't matter what all people ridiculed him for. He knew that one day, since he was faithful to the gospel and what he was called to do, he would be in the presence of his Savior. And today, we have the same hope. It doesn't matter the pain you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. If you are faithful to what God has called you to do, if you're faithful to see Jesus as the Christ, you will be in eternity with him where there is no pain, there's no struggles, there's no strife, but eternal joy. And you might be wondering why am I preaching all this today since I'm preaching to a group of people who have been in church for a while. But the reason I'm saying this is because from my own story, the gospel is just a story sometimes because of the hardness of my own heart. And I know sometimes I get so caught up in just saying Jesus died for my sins because it's just easy and it's what we say. But today I want us to realize that we have to ask God to soften our hearts to fully understand what happened on Calvary. See, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth even though he was fully God. And even though he did no sin, he lived a perfect and holy life. He walked on the same earth we walk on today. He struggled with the same things we had to struggle with, but he didn't give in to temptation and he never failed. But even though he didn't know sin, for our own sake, he went to the cross and took nails into his hand and into his body. And as the blood was running down his body, all that he was thinking about was how we wouldn't have a relationship without him interceding for us today. And the, the, like, the crazy thing is that now when God looks at us, he doesn't see the sin that separates us. He doesn't see the imperfection that's holding us back, but he sees his son. He sees the blood that's covering us today. And I've been talking about how we could see Jesus today. But even before we can see Jesus, even before we get it all right, he saw us. He saw us like sheep that were stuck in the pit that he needed to pick up because we were helpless on our own. I don't want us to be satisfied with doing the same things over and over because we've been, it's been working thus far. I want us to get into God's word, abide and learn more about Jesus today. I want us to spend time in worship, not only here, but at your houses too. I want you to get plugged into this community and grow together. Because as we continue to set our eyes on Jesus and see him as Christ and Lord, we'll be able to move further like we've been learning about. I just want to end in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this time, God. Thank you for allowing us just to be in your word right now. God, we ask that I have no pride about anything I've done. God, we ask that this all just be for your glory. God, I ask that you plant the seed in the hearts today, God. And if it's your will, you'll bring growth in the coming days, God. I ask that we never just think of the gospel as a story, never think about it as just something that had to happen. But God, we ask that we think about it as our only hope for the future, God. I ask that today you be all we search for, God. I thank you for this church family, God. I thank you for their heart. I thank you for the love that's in this room, God. I ask that we continually set you above everything we do, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.